the name of our show. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Welcome to The Large Glass. I'm Todd. I'm Terry. And this is our weekly broadcast where we bring you a new artist or an art-related theme to talk about every Tuesday night, and we're happy to have you. How's it going? Well, let's see. Oh, there's Ben in the chat. How's it going, Ben? Nice Hello. to see you. And Mom, of course. Yes. Hi. Good to see you. Hi. Um, John so Park is here. John Park is here. How's it going? Hello. Good to see you. And there's Pizza. Jess. Good. The usual suspects the are usual in the house. The usual suspects. I'm glad you two are here because we've got photography tonight, and it's been a long time coming because we promised this show a while back, mm -hmm. and we should have had three photo shows by now. At least. Yeah. Well, we've got yeah. more in the future, actually, yes. so that's a good thing. Yeah. Um, no one won the pin. No one won the pin. So I guess I really stumped people this week. So we had some good guesses, but nobody quite got it. So um, tomorrow I'll probably post the image from the painting that it was taken from off of Instagram. So for those of you who don't know, every Thursday on our Instagram account, Terry will post a cropped image of a piece of art, and it's your job to guess the artist. If you guess the artist, you get one of our really cool limited edition enamel pins that we're running out of. We are. And we're going to be creating edition number two, mm -hmm. and that's going to be an absinthe glass this time, which yes. is going to be super. You don't want to leave it a mystery? I just want to say, it's going to be this. Well, it's too late to leave it a well, mystery. Well, now it is. But you're going to love it. Sure. I promise you're going to love it. Yes, of course you're going to love it. Yes, we should, it's going to be awesome. We should drink. We should. Okay. Let's do it. So you've already pre-gamed. <laughs> I have. As per usual, you're having the Southern Tier pumpkin. I'm stretching out the pumpkin ale just a little bit longer. This is my last one, so there won't be any more after this, but it's still prime time season for for pumpkin beer. And so. speaking of pumpkin beer, Pumpkin Audrey's here. Hello. Hi. John says, I want the next one as well. Well, hopefully, John, we've got a long list of them to come. Southern Tier is from New York, and I'm going to have... A Manhattan. Ooh. So why don't you talk a little bit about where our artist hails from tonight while I well, shake it up. Our artist currently lives in New York, but he is actually from the south, uh, southern portion of England from a town called Poole. And we thought New York was appropriate since we couldn't get our hands on anything from England right away. So. Forgive the noise for a, a second. shaky, shaky. Thanks, 63. Little bullet Manhattan. In my days of bartending, I was taught to shake until your hand physically freezes to the container. Hmm. And it will. Will it? Oh. oh. It actually sticks to it. Huh. And you know you got it nice and cold. By the way, these glasses, these are my great, great Mom, correct me if I'm wrong. My great, great, great grandmothers, um, I have had their rye before. It's quite good, actually. Um, but these are beautiful, nice and colored. So I instead love of the, the large. beveled nature of them, too. They've got some really it's nice. It's like a hammered, it's almost a hammered look. Oh, that's going to be lovely. That is very pretty. Right? Look at that. Nice little light ochre color. Decent, decent pour. So here's to all of you. This is episode 62. 62. We're one away from 63's episode. Hey! That's pretty funny, actually. Right? Yeah. Cheers. Cheers. Oh, Boo Jazz is we're drinking Traverse mm -hmm. City Straight Bourbon Whiskey. Ooh. So we're all on the same page. Yes. And you need to have a little... Uh, I believe, if I'm not correct, the beer is aged in a bourbon barrel. Perfect. You're in. Cask. Yeah. So to give it that bourbon nice cask. vanilla, oaky kind of nice kind of uh, taste on it. Oh, yeah. good. Well, as per the usual, uh, great grandmother. So the glasses were my great grandmother's. Okay, so we're off to a good start here. We are. We had a good show on Sunday, so as some of you know, we moved our segment for Artist's Birthdays to a whole Sunday episode of its own. It's 10 a.m. on Sunday morning because we found that the birthdays were creeping into the length of the show. Our show went from one hour to one hour and a half, and we wanted to rein it in, make it a, a regular hour, 
And uh, we were having trouble doing that. So what we did is we created a Sunday morning show in a diner uh, where we go over each of the artist's birthdays for that week as an individual little three-minute capsule. So you get a little more about the artist than you would have gotten on this show. Um, and then we save those as these nice little encapsulated videos. Nice little videos. Quick art history lesson for you. Yeah. So, so yeah. they're working well. We had like eight or nine of them from last week. Yeah. There were a lot of birthdays. Uh, let's see. Memory Vessel says, I didn't get the memo. Just, oh, yeah. Well, that's just that's, wine. That's just wine. That's okay. You, yes. can, you can get it on the bourbon next week. David Backus has a gin martini. Ooh. Oh, we're all, is it on the rocks or is it is it up? I like them. I mean, I kind of, my thing is up, but uh, I get it on the rocks. Hmm. So, so we're a little early going into the artist. Typically we okay. chat for a little while. Well, I think we're still trying to find our groove with this new format, but I think it's okay. Like, pretty good. We got well, we to recognize a supporter. We do have to recognize a supporter. Up with olives. Perfect. Ooh. Perfect. Yum. Um, well, let's do the recognize of a supporter. Let's okay. do that first. So we'll pop in here, and that's that's not what was supposed to be up but here. But maybe one day he will be a recognized supporter. <laughs> that would be nice, wouldn't it? That would be nice. Uh, let's see. To this week's featured supporter is Shirley Perlinski. Thank you, Shirley. We really appreciate everything you do because you've been a fantastic supporter. You're always reposting the stuff we put up to plug the show. You're always there. So we think you're great. Thanks for watching. Thanks for being there. And uh, we're looking forward to a, a lot more of that. And by the way, we got to talk about the painting that we're giving away. Oh, yeah. And the schedule. And that's so going to be have next more. week. We, we have do have more to, to talk, talk about. about. So go ahead. Well, next week we have a really special show because we have a fantastic guest joining us live from his studio. It feels like a rock star kind of moment because it's going to be Alan Wexler for episode 63. And we will be giving away a painting by Susan Stillman. Right. So Susan Stillman, who's a great painter, was generous enough to donate a painting to our show, which we will be giving away on the show with Alan Wexler. So it's your opportunity to score a piece of art. Um, now... I'm still working out the details on how we're going to give that away. We've been doing the wheel thing lately. Mm -hmm. We've been, however, I feel like the the Twitch platform we broadcast on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitch. I feel like the Twitch platform's uh, giveaway system is the most efficient and allows the time to kind of go by. We can do things while people sign up for it. Mm -hmm. So what we might do is we might be giving away that painting on the Twitch platform. So this isn't hard to do. But if you go over to Twitch and you're not already a member of Twitch, and it's free, you can just sign up for an account and then follow us. Uh, you can go over there, grab yourself an account, and then next week on the show, just watch via Twitch. It's basically the same thing as watching on Facebook or YouTube. And you can win that painting if you are a follower over there. So Memory Vessel says, I've been saving my coins. Mm. Exactly. If you do viewer loyalty, which basically means you watch on there a lot, you save up these coins. They're also free. And you can use them to get a slight edge in the odds of you winning. So mm -hmm. that's kind of a very cool thing. That is super cool. And the last bit of news we have for you is that this month, we in November, we have five Tuesdays. Today is the first of those five Tuesdays. For the next four of the five Tuesdays, we have live artists on the show. So every week from here on out, we've got a live artist visiting us, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So we told you- It's really exciting. This is kind of like what we dreamed for the show, so well, I, good. Well, I feel like for you guys, it's much more interesting to have them in their studios talking with us. We, you can ask them questions. It's uh, You get to see around their space sometimes, but mm -hmm. it's, um, it's more than just our voice, right? Which I think is really important. You get to hear from them. So next week, like we said, we have Alan Wexler. The week after that, we have Alex Gross, who is the cabinet card aficionado that we introduced to you many episodes ago. Mm -hmm. We're excited to have him on the show live. The week after that, we have photographer Blaze Hayward is going to be on our show. He's 
fantastic. Yes. We love talking to him. And we've actually had him on briefly before with the Brownstone Art when they had their photography exhibit. He's, That's right. He's fantastic. So we're excited about that. And then the last Tuesday in November, we have artist Lyndon Eller. She is currently in an exhibition with me at uh, the Court Tree Collective, which is an online exhibition. You can go and see that. It's called Actual Paper. She's a collage artist, and her work is stellar. So four live artists coming up. We are really excited about that. So now I'm done talking. Now you're done talking. I think you should talk for a little while. Okay, <laughs> I can. <laughs> Why don't you introduce us to tonight's artist so we can kind of get rolling. Okay, well, we've been talking about doing a photographer for quite some time. I know that Jess and John are very excited about that because they asked us a long time ago this summer. Um, but we found one that we absolutely admire and adore, and he really embodies the, the philosophy of candid photography. Um, his name is Daniel Featherstone. He hails from the southern portion of England from a town called Poole, but he currently resides in New York. Uh, he was educated at Bournemouth University. Um, he's been in the United States for about 25 years, so he's been established for a while. He primarily works as a graphic designer, and he was also an art director uh, for Ralph Lauren, the label Nautica. Um, and basically how he kind of came into photography, he's got some graffiti roots, but also on his lunch breaks is when he really got into street candid photography, and he has a beat. He works primarily at the intersection of 57th and 5th Avenue. Uh, it was on his lunch break or his commuting route, and he would just go out and start taking photographs of the people in that area. Um, his, he was also heavily influenced as he was growing up by graffiti, and he was a graffiti writer. I should say that he started using photography as a way to record and document the artwork that he was creating with graffiti, and it just kind of evolved from there. You know, I, I loved seeing the fact that he was involved in graffiti, and I always, and so, you know, I also used to do graffiti, and I found that the one surefire way to get your ass caught was to take a picture of what you were doing, or yeah. even worse, have someone shooting video of you. But that's a whole different story. Um, I am curious to see some of his early documentation because I couldn't find that. We've, we see a lot of his, his, I'm curious about a lot of things with him, um, but we see a lot of his candid portraits and moments on the street, but I would really like to see what he was doing because back then he said that he was interested in the abstract of photography. He was interested in uh, photographing abstract shapes and and scenes so i'm i'm curious to see exactly what he meant by that yeah yeah but makes me think of tom mcglynn a little bit and how tom bit. mcglynn posts these really interesting compositions Very on instagram so. that are mundane scenes from city life but they're not because they have a lot of curious relationships going on yeah well yeah. again that's a whole another another story so um so we have a lot to talk about with this guy. And you know, when we talk about street photographers in New York, a lot of names come to mind. Mm -hmm. And we could have done, we had talked about so many different possibilities for tonight's show. Mm -hmm. But there's some really, really good reasons, I think, why we got hooked on on Daniel Featherstone in this case. And um, I, I, I feel like there is, uh, of course, something super genuine here, something really connectable. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't necessarily want to talk about the artists we didn't decide to do, but I think they might creep in a little bit. Yeah, well, I think when we were also discussing, and typically you all know, we don't really talk a whole lot about the artists prior to getting on the show because we love the organic dialogue that flows. Um, but we did talk about a little bit because you had said that there was some photographer that came into mind whom he was influenced by, so it was right on the money. And then I thought of another photographer that's not mentioned, but there's something connected going on. But we use those two reference points to kind of see what Featherstone was doing different and what creates his heart, uh, his art, and makes it so unique. Right, and and of course, it 
I didn't do any reading, really. Mm -hmm. I mean, I did a little bit. But the first thing I thought of when I saw Featherstone's work was I thought of Bill Cunningham. Mm -hmm. Now, Bill Cunningham was an icon in New York. And I actually had a student of mine uh, actually run into him and take a selfie with him years and years ago. And it was very easy to spot Bill Cunningham on the streets because he wore this blue jacket and he rode around on his bicycle and he took photography, he took pictures. Now, he was famous for street fashion photography. So he'd be looking for characters that were dressed in a particular fashionable way. He was looking for the cut of a dress or a hairline or maybe a particular piece of jewelry. And he would try to either candidly or overtly shoot an image of that person. And so when we see Featherstone's street photography, mm -hmm. you can't help but think of him. Now, I have some Cunningham stuff to maybe pop in at some point if we feel like there's a, uh, an appropriate reference to mm -hmm. make. But I thought it was good to talk about him because I also think there's a huge difference between Featherstone's photography and Cunningham's photography. I will say, Jess is pointing out that I was thinking of him, meaning Cunningham, when you said 57th and 5th, and yes, and there is a, a link because Featherstone says that he was influenced by him and he knew that they were kind of on the same path, Right. but you're going to see some influence, but you're also going to see a divergence in some techniques. Hi, Carolyn Thau. It's Hello. okay that you're late. It's nice to see you. 63 says, there's also the Winogrand influence, albeit in color. Mm. Yeah, and I actually, you know, you know what? The one thing I try to struggle, I struggle to try and do is when these references come in, I'm like, ah, yes. And I should have images of that that I can just pop up. Sometimes I can and sometimes I can't. Let's talk about Featherstone's, um, let's just, I, I kind of put these in an order that I thought was a good lead in mm -hmm. to the work. Sure. So he shoots candidly on the streets of New York and he captures his subjects from a variety of connection points, I'll just call them for now. And so, you know, I, I love this this shot of the woman in the red glasses with the red hat. Um, she is oblivious to his presence, right? She's just m moving through the crowd. And, and what I want to talk about in these pieces, I'm sure you probably want to talk about other things as well, but I'd like to talk about how the the people that he's capturing, the the characters that he's capturing, and how we connect with them, okay? So I'm just gonna kind of like talk about that, but I'm not sure, I don't wanna override you. No, go ahead. You. So you're looking at something, do you see something? No, I'm up? just, I'm actually looking at the portrait and um, go ahead. Okay, all right, I'll keep going. Okay. So, you know, there's there are some images that look like they are almost posed or almost too perfect. Like this woman who has this beautiful sweater on with this almost the exact same pattern as whatever it is that's in the background. But again, she kind of has this distant glance. She kind of is looking off into space. He's captured her candidly. And, and we get to see a side of her that is um, uh, not aware, not connected to the photographer. And that's one thing that I think we can say Bill Cunningham didn't necessarily do. Mm -hmm. He did sometimes, mm -hmm. but it wasn't a sort of precursor to taking the photo. Mm -hmm. Bill Cunningham was out there. It was obvious it was him a lot of the right. time, yes. especially later in his career. Yes. And if he rolled up on you, he got a lot of attention from the people that were around him, sure. which frustrated him. With Featherstone's work, it's almost a prerequisite for the shot. And I can't say that for sure because I haven't spoken to him and I haven't read anything that confirms that. However, there, it feels as if the, the him not being there taking the picture seems to almost be part of the formula for how he'd like to capture the image. It doesn't always necessarily work that way, though. No, it doesn't. And actually, I did do some reading on him. Oh, so good. I can confirm. So I'm not just pulling that this that out. That was of a precursor. Um, when there was an article in AIAP.com in 2017 by David Schnauer. And it talked about how he began uh, photographing um, on the street. So he had this interest in photography from graffiti and everything like that. And when he first started taking pictures, he actually used an iPhone 5S and he switched to the DSLR to make bigger and, and uh, more advanced prints. Um, digital, he worked with a Nikon uh, D810. Um, he switched between uh, uh, two different kinds of lenses. One was a sharper focus, one was more flattering. He also preferred to work with film, and he used the Leinhoff Technica. 
um, in mm. uh, Hasselbad 500. Mm. Um, he, precursor, he wanted to keep it candid, and he was concerned that when he switched from the I, uh, iPhone to some of these more obvious cameras and he was taking pictures, if that was going to influence the dynamic between the subject that he was shooting and himself. But he did say in the interview that most of his subjects were completely oblivious. Um, and even when there was that second when their eyes connected, most of them didn't say anything. He did have one interaction with somebody who, I guess, the way that the article described it, the gentleman was a lot older and he was with a younger woman and he started yelling at him and it traumatized him a little bit. But for the most part, they have been either, he's gone either unnoticed or just kind of vanished off with his photo. So um, he did not ask for permission to shoot the candid photographs. Um, so this kind of confirms what you're saying, that We're that wasn't that... Yeah, and, and and Memory Vessels is not a slumpy camera. I'm sure she's referring to the Hasselblad in there, which is a camera that when you see it on the street, like when you see a Leica on the street or you see a Hasselblad on the street, you think, wow, that right. person's serious. Yes. And, and it's very hard to sort of remain anonymous with a camera like that on you. Mm -hmm. But I was doing a little bit of thinking about this notion of that kind of obliviousness on the part of the subject. And it's interesting to think about how especially in the age of the selfie, right? We see teenage girls that'll spend 20 minutes composing one selfie, right? Just for that perfect shot. And so the, this age of um, the photograph as a hyper ideal image of the self, that's something I'm sure we're gonna bring up in this a lot. But, but then there's Featherstone capturing this, you know, well, first of all, from a, from a compositional standpoint, from a lighting standpoint, from a color standpoint, and from a, a sort of subject standpoint, he does a really good job at picking out interesting subjects. So there mm -hmm. is a kind of ideal there, even if it's a not ideal ideal, mm -hmm. right? But then there's this really beautiful thing about the disconnect we feel in the public eye, okay? We want to be seen because we're human, right. but we don't want to be seen, especially when we're walking the streets of New York. So we don't make eye contact, Yes. But maybe we have a sense of fashion. Right. And so we get dressed up. We go out for a walk. Mm -hmm. And while we're present on the street, we're not. We are and we're not. So we, we, we sort of cast the eye above the crowd. Or maybe once in a while we make a quick eye contact with somebody. But I can't tell you how many times I've walked past, you know, celebrity or people I know. Mm -hmm. And because I'm in that tunnel vision mode... So the odds of seeing Featherstone shooting you mm -hmm. are so slim. So slim. And I, and I get that, yeah. right? But then at the same time, there's this visibility thing. Mm -hmm. And there's almost as if, it's almost as if your eye is not connecting, but there's this little background thing churning that knows you could be noticed or knows that someone might be looking at you. You immediately know when someone's walking towards you, mm -hmm. right? There, there's like there's like a radar a New Yorker has about the presence of other individuals, mm. which makes me think then Featherstone might have been seen more easily. So it's, it's a curious thing. And, and I love this notion of the visible versus the invisible. Yes. Not only from the standpoint of looking at his photos and thinking about the people in them, mm -hmm. but from the standpoint of me and my relatability to the situation on either side of the camera, hmm. which is which is really kind of cool. Um, so then we get to something like this, mm -hmm. and it's that moment when you're seen, mm -hmm. or when Featherstone is seen, mm -hmm. right? And I want to talk about that. I want to talk about that too, because many of his subjects carry it a similar expression of being caught, being caught in a moment. Um, and you don't really see that with some of the other photographers that we were talking about. I think this is one of the big differentiating points is that connection and it's in a moment when you're caught and you were oblivious to something, but then you know you, you discovered that there was like this voyeuristic kind of thing happening. Um, when we look at Cunningham's work, um, when we were talking about that, usually he focused on fashion. So people go out there in their plumage and they're looking for some kind of attention and it was this very uh, uh, pleasant exchange. 
when the other photographer I was thinking of at the time, who's got a very popular, famous blog, Humans of New York, Brandon Stanton, I'm going to throw him out there. He also photographs people on the street as well. And usually the images are gorgeous photographs. Usually the people are have something very um, noticeable about them, something some really pretty, gorgeous, beautiful part that most people wouldn't notice, like the way that the hair is braided or the, the extensions or the, the nails, something like that, the way they are with somebody. But he does something different because he actually asks for permission. He goes up to the person. He engages in the dialogue. They tell him a little bit. This of, is Cunningham. This, this is Stanton. So oh, Stanton, he, sorry. He establishes a relationship with his the people that he shoots, and it creates the picture. Here, with Featherstone, we are left to fill everything in because he hasn't established, he doesn't know his subjects. So he leaves us with these portraits that we can fill in the dialogue. Um, I also want to point out that he was a little bit more... I had an image of Featherstone, but I can't seem to find it. I'm looking for... Uh, not Featherstone. An image of Stanton. I'm starting to com completely confuse my names. Um, can I just say something about the humans of New York sure. thing and Stanton's work? Because what I feel like... Here's one of Stanton's images. It is not of him. But take a look at the image we have up right now, which is a Daniel Featherstone image. And then we look at the Stanton image mm -hmm. from Humans of New York, mm -hmm. right? It's a little zoomed out right now. But, you know, here we have another striking, confrontational, meaning looking right at me image. And I will say there's a lot of similar elements, like there's that pop of color. Oh, right? my God, this guy's like beautiful. There's really ex um, features that are noticeable and beautiful and lovely and charming. And some people wouldn't have noticed it. Except Stanton hones in on it, but... But there is a knowing, and I think this is what you're talking about. Yes. There's a knowing in this man's face. There's a recognition that he's having the picture taken. Mm -hmm. And then if we go back to our this other image here, there's just a slight difference in her glance. And this is where that magic lies. Now, Stanton's work, I'm going to take Stanton's work outside the realm of fine art, and I'm going to put Stanton's work more in the realm of theater. Humans of New York is theater. And the reason it's theater is because the stage is set with some posed shot, but then laying on top of that well, is a screenplay. Well, it's, that, it's, it's more of portrait photography. Correct. No, and I'm not saying anything right. negative about Stanton's right. work. Theater is, is something actually that we love, mm -hmm. right? And narrative is something that we love. And the narratives that accompany the picture in Humans of New York, the, you know, that's the type of thing that, you know, you can find a trinket at a flea market for a quarter, right? Bring it home, type a beautiful story about its history that doesn't even exist, make it fictional, put it on eBay, and sell the 25 cent item for $38 because it has the narrative. And, and what does the narrative do? It gives us something to relate to, mm -hmm. right? And all of a sudden, now it has value. Right. So Stanton imbues these portrait photos with a value that comes with the narrative that goes with them. Featherstone's magic comes in a much more profound package that lives all by itself. Mm -hmm. And that, that's the gripping thing for me, mm -hmm. right? And so what's happening here, I feel, is he sees this woman and he begins to line up that shot. She's probably looking right into her phone, right? And he's right in front of her and she's looking into her phone, maybe choosing the next track, maybe searching for something, that, a place she's going. And then she has that just slight awareness, that little radar thing in the back of her head goes off and says, there's a camera pointing at you. And what happens is there's an internal self, right? It's that self that's tunnel visioned. It's inside your own mind. It's the, it's, the, it's the walking self in New York. And there is a blink of an instant that you turn outward and you are revealed. Your vulnerabilities are all right there. Before the ego has a chance to sort of cover it all up and be like, you know, I don't want you to see that part of me. Mm -hmm. There's a moment and Featherstone captures that moment, which mm -hmm. is just like, to me, it's right there. Mm -hmm. She's like, she's completely exposed for a mm -hmm. second. And it's that recognition that she's, you know, being right. watched. Right. But it's beautiful. It is beautiful. Let me keep going. And you do feel that he recognizes the beauty in these people as oh my well. God. Even when he captures them, perhaps in something that wouldn't typically be viewed as 
flattering. Um, but he still sees something in these people. I mean, like, look at this, that, that uh, alliteration of gold going on and boss. And there's so much going on in her expression, how he caught that expression in that moment. Right. Right. Um, we got some good comments because 63 is like, wow, now we have some confrontation. Memory Vessel says there's a relationship, the other's a capture. That yeah. is perfect. That's yeah. absolutely perfect, right? Yes. Because in, in the relationship, we have a give and take, uh -huh. right? It's me and you. Uh -huh. But in the capture, it's really just them. It's, yes. Like, I, I can't really enter that. It's like, oh, that's a nice picture of somebody. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. look at their smile. Or, right. But I don't have that kind of that 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 back and forth mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. uh boo jazz is saying he probably shot this from a slight distance since the background and her phone I are out of focus he did i believe he did but yes you know, i'm not a hundred percent sure so. well unless he shot unless he shot with a prime lens and he was right down around like 1.4 so, right. so he with used a prime, a, lens. a prime lens the 50 millimeter prime and a 70 to 200 millimeter zoom so, and he said that that one had a more flattering effect, and the 50 millimeter prime had a sharper effect. So he he um, bit, uh, vacillated think, between those two. I don't want to correct you, but I wonder if that's reversed. Is it um, possible that those two things are reversed? It, it could be. Because typically a prime lens that has a, a, a wider it aperture, could, it could be. It'll I give you this diffused my... kind of look. You're mm -hmm. gonna you, you're gonna fact check. Me I'm on gonna that. fact check you. That's fine. I, I love being fact yes. checked. Yes. Oh, um, Let's see, Pumpkin Audrey says, maybe the female subject might have been creeped out. Well, yeah, understandably so. I'm actually sure that many of the subjects, regardless of gender, were probably creeped out with a camera, you know, on them. And and 63 made a good comment before about the Hasselblad, because with the Hasselblad, you can look down through the top, which allows you to kind of keep the camera very low and sort of more discreet, um, which is a very good point. I am going to say... Um, that what I said is what he said. Okay. So okay, yeah. my bad. And I'm not a photographer, so I'm, I'm. I'm. Yeah, I mean that's that's his impression of how these these lenses work. Gotcha. That's what he liked about them. Gotcha. Oh, Amanda Tulin's here. Hi, Amanda. Glenn is here. Glenn says it's Glenn. similar to what the paparazzi do. Very much so. Just that these are not celebrities. Not sure how I feel about that. Well, I think that. Hmm. I I thought of that as well. Are we invading privacy? But there is an invasiveness to the term, to the notion of paparazzi. Paparazzi, sure. But, it, but when it's a person just living their life who's not soliciting public attention, although... I don't know about don't the paparazzi know. thing now. I'm like, I okay, so know. paparazzi are doing this for profit, number right. one, right? They're right. doing, And it's a kind of exploitation. Now, mm -hmm. I know Glenn will say, but there's an exploitation here. And, and there is, right? But I feel like the difference between capturing someone who's got a little bit of too much mayonnaise on their mouth because they didn't eat their sandwich properly, like, you know, you catch that. But there are instances which he does capture them in a moment that's not, not flattering. flattering. And it's, it's sure. something that could be construed as embarrassing. Well, okay, okay. I feel like whenever we take something, right, and this is like she's flipping him off. She's got the bird she's got up. The bird she's going like on. she's like this, right? And she But there's no eye contact, so is she Oh it's, no, she, she's... it's humorous though. It's it's a very humorous Uh I don't know if it's picture. humorous. You don't I, think this is humorous? I, I, well look at first of all first of all, she's not having her best day. I, I'm not saying the interaction is humorous. I'm saying as viewers who are coming to look at Featherstone's work. This this is a humorous photo. I'm not mm. looking at this and feeling anything other than like, wow, look at all this going on. I, I'm looking at this and I'm thinking to myself, she's pissed. Sure. And and she's looking at me. She's not making eye contact with the camera. Well, regardless, yeah. I feel like there are moments in these that I think raise more questions sure. than define particular things. Sure. Right? 63 is like, I'm seeing some anger. Um, Glenn says she's the Featherstone. He, she's the Featherstone Sean Penn, Ooh. or Alec Baldwin these days. If you want to go there, oh dear. Um, yeah. Well, okay. I, I can buy that. I think to some degree. However, I think the end result and the intention are much more uh, 
I, I can agree with them a little bit more. I can get behind them more, mm -hmm. right? I mean, if you're going to be on the cover of Weekly World News or you're going to sort of be representational of the human condition in the city of New York, vulnerability, um, I can get behind that, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And I think I think Daniel Featherstone does this really because he recognizes the beauty in this. Of course. Right? Not, not the exploitative right. uh, sort of way. Right. I do want to take a quote that he actually mentions on his website about his subjects and um, capturing the diverse diversity of the backgrounds of the people because mm -hmm. he's in this 10 block radius that's where he's shooting and he says that mostly he's shooting plastic surgery plastic surgery aristocracy to naive tourists to the underprivileged homeless. So he's really encompassing a broad range of peoples from all different walks of life. Yeah, yeah. And we see them all in the range that I've picked out in mm -hmm. here. And I and I think as viewers, we're going to react to these differently from a number of standpoints. One, we'll react differently based on who the subjects are in the context of who we are. Right. Right? I, I think depending on our level of privilege, mm -hmm. we're going to react to the people in these Probably, yes. differently, yeah, right? Sure. So I, I, that's something that I I, um, I appreciate and, and, and do want to think about, but it's very hard for me to maybe put myself in the, sh myself in the shoes of somebody else, mm -hmm. right? 63 says, he does seem to wait for a moment of connection. And that's the thing. And that's one of the reasons, 63, that's one of the reasons I put this image in here right now is because it's sort of like he's lining up that shot, and then there's just the. It's, I swear that is the split you know, second the eyes turn to the camera. And this happens quite a bit in his photos. And when I was reading, um, and not really thinking about that, because there is that that connection where they're being caught. But he says that sometimes people and people don't always notice him. But it seemed like that wasn't very important to her. But I'm, I think I think I'm going to argue and say it was because we're seeing that in so many of his his shots. Mm -hmm. Like there's something very important about that connection. But yeah, and, and I, I don't doubt that necessarily. I do know though, in, in terms of being the photographer and having the equipment on your face, mm -hmm. right? There's, there's not that split second process of just hold it up and push the button. There's, there's man, you know, I mean, he's shooting manually, yeah. right? So he's thinking about elements of how you know, the holy trinity of ISO, aperture, right. and shutter speed are going to line up to give him right. the various elements of this picture. And while he's doing that, the radar of the person walking by is picking up on him. Sure. So I, I, I think it's I think it's it happens sometimes. It doesn't happen other times. Mm -hmm. And you get what you get. Mm hmm. Uh, Memory Vessel says, kind of, I want to go walk the 10 block radius trying to be captured. You can try it. Again, it's the intersection of 57th and 5th Avenue. I also want to make a comment about when he shoots because he kind of does not go with the golden hour rules at all. Usually they say the best times, the most flattering light to shoot um, people especially is sunrise and sunset those are glorious hours with uh, beautiful diffused filtered light that you know cascades softly on flesh tones and everything he chooses broad daylight usually he likes the reflection of the buildings and all of that um, ambient light reflecting back upon the person and the subject. So he purposefully chooses these hours. Now, granted, it was his lunch hour. It was also a convenient time for him to shoot. Mm. But the, the lighting is really, because this is usually the least flattering moment of the day to shoot if you're going to shoot in natural light. And I want to jump in and do some, I want to talk a little bit about light because that's something I think that's really, um, I've got some examples here that are actually really quite interesting to look at. But I missed a question from Ben. Uh, ben wants to know if he's ever been chased by a person. Do we know if he's ever been chased? One time, and it goes back to the first story, he had tried to take a picture, or I believe he took a picture. I, I'm curious to see which picture it was, but it was of an older gentleman, and I believe he had a younger woman with him. <clears throat> and the gentleman noticed that he snapped the picture, and then he started yelling, police. 
and I believe Featherstone had to run. I'm not quite sure, but he did mention how traumatic that experience was for him because mm. he wasn't quite sure how it was going to end. Mm. And he does say sometimes when he goes out shooting, he's conscientious that, you know, it might not always end so well. He hasn't had any other problems that I know of or that I've read about since. But um, On the note of light. I think this is one of my favorite images. I, lo I love this image. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I... I've been talking a lot about this notion of the, the gaze of the subject, the gaze of the photographer. We've been talking about this kind of connectedness, but we're not really necessarily talking a lot about composition and what he's thinking about in terms of how he's he's making these formal, like mm -hmm. the, 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 the ingredients that are going into this. Mm -hmm. And um, the way he thinks about light is, is really quite interesting in some of these. So in this one, I love how this woman in her in her incredibly beautifully dyed hair, her incredibly sort of poppy, you know, um, um, botanical shirt, um, the yellow straps on her arm, or whatever bag that leads to, um, how she kind of has this overstated kind of presence, but her skin and her very person almost vanishes into that white marble it wall. It does, Which yes. is really... It's, it's really strange. It is. And it's sad. There's a, Okay, so there's a beauty here, mm -hmm. and there's a sadness here. Mm -hmm. There's like, this is like both, this is both like B-52s mm -hmm. and this kind of other, um, I don't know. I, I, I get a little lump in my throat for her when I see her. I'm like, mm -hmm. oh, she's, she's you know, I, I feel like she's a real sweet person, but there's also this kind of, something's missing. Well... Usually, and I've heard this before, and it's just more on a personal level, that I've heard when people age, they do feel like they go unnoticed. Invisible. They become invisible, and I've, I've heard that before. I've heard that especially with women. Um, once you hit a certain age, there's that invisibility, you're no longer noticed, and we see efforts to be visible, right? Like that hair. Those the citrus clothing, everything about her screams notice me, the big glasses. But it is interesting that he chooses to portray her with the skin skin fading. Well, and there's some great comments going on right now. So mom says it looks like a painting, mm -hmm. right? And then the, then the notion of hockney comes up. And there's a loneliness, there in, a, is a in, loneliness. A, in a hockney painting. So mm -hmm. that I think that's right on the money. I love that. Mm -hmm. But then there's also what Glenn says. It has the effect of being overexposed without actually being overexposed mm -hmm. and the notion of overexposure yeah there's the formal standpoint from photography but then there's this other this other standpoint of the vulnerability exposure mm -hmm. of the subject right mm -hmm. so there's this kind of play maybe on you know form and content there mm -hmm. a little bit which I which I really like mm -hmm. um, so so you've got this kind of this, this light thing that's happening here right and, and now, now compare this or I should say contrast this to this which is just like now we're sort of getting into this kind of tenebristic, um, you know, like uh, this this kind of emergence from the darkness, right? I love how he is perfectly framed by his, I, I'm assuming, street cart, yeah. um, little, little kiosk. Um, and I have an even better example. I don't want to jump off of this image too quickly, but there are a couple of images where it's almost like the Rembrandt-esque kind of chiaroscuro, tenebristic kind of approach to light begins to play in, right? And it's this, and I love what Glenn said about exposure because some of these are underexposed or they have the appearance of being underexposed without actually being underexposed. Because just because something's dark doesn't mean it's underexposed, right? So like think about this image for a second, right? It has a, a general darkness to it, but look at how he stands out in this. He almost emerges out of a murkiness, mm -hmm. right? And there's a certain perfection to his exposure while leaving the rest of it behind on some level, mm. right? Or consider this image, right? In this image, again, this, this reminds me of a Rembrandt painting. I mean, look at how he kind of emerges out of the darkness. The light hits his face in a very theatrical kind of way, mm -hmm. but it's really just face and hands a little bit of attention on the garments, mm -hmm. but it's really like, you know, it's quite beautiful. Mm -hmm. Uh-oh, 63 saying, ah, Photoshop. Yeah. I wondered if that would come up. 
That I can't tell you. I can't quite tell you what his uh, darkroom techniques are. Um, I know Memory Vessel saying that she loves, loves, loves the framing. There was a lot of things I loved about that that image too, because you felt like you were being confronted with that gentleman, and he's selling, you know, cigarettes, and there's this thing saying "gotta be over 21," and there was just something in that expression about that. But I'm going back to this one. I'm not quite sure what his darkroom techniques are, and and he does use film on occasion, so I'm gonna say that as well. But hang on. Hang on. Before we set a tone that Photoshop is bad, right? Because I don't want to do that, right. right? Because here's the thing. Here's the thing. In the end, I think what we're looking at um, is going to set the tone. Now, was Photoshop incorporated he's in this? He's just saying he's not downplaying it. No, I, I don't think he is. <laughs> I, I, I don't think 63 is downplaying yeah, Photoshop. Yeah, no, no, no. But, but... I think sometimes we, as a culture, when we're looking at photography, especially unseasoned, I'm, I'm, I'm not a photographer. Right. I teach Photoshop, mm -hmm. but I'm not a photographer. Mm -hmm. So I think Photoshop is another tool in the toolbox that can be used for better or for worse, right? Just like many of the other tools out there, mm -hmm. right? So when we consider Photoshop's use, I would guarantee that these photos at some point in time either see Lightroom or Photoshop well, for course, some reason. Of course, right? right? Yeah, yeah. But so then what happens? It's like, well, you know, are there are there little artistic choices made? Probably. And do they work damn well? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Do I feel like these are overdone in that respect? No way. And I don't mm -hmm. think 63 is saying that. No. But I was hoping Photoshop would come up yeah. for that very reason. Yeah. Because I don't want to demonize it necessarily. That's right. And if he doesn't use any Photoshop whatsoever because he makes that a point of his practice, fine. You know, that mm -hmm. might be like saying I never use Comic Sans in a, in a graphic composition or I never, ever, ever use Old Holland Cobalt. Why would I not use Old Holland Cobalt yeah, Violet? I was going to say you never use Comic Sans, but the Old Holland. Okay. The, the, the right. point the is, point is, is that I might choose to te keep certain tools out of the picture. Like I might not paint with a palette knife. Mm -hmm. I might not, you know, use a material in sculpture because I find it to be schlocky. Mm -hmm. Here's another one. Look at this. I mean, this is oh, just it's so beautiful. exquisite. So beautiful. Exquisite. And now, the one thing, so he does have a website, and it's Daniel Featherstone. I'm just going to pull this up real quick. Um, Memory Vessel says it's all about the photographer's eye. Level contrast. Yes. Uh, it's danielfeatherstone.com, and he's got a fantastic Instagram as well. Um, but on his website, he breaks down his photographs into street moments and street portraits. And I'm having a hard time discerning the difference between those two because there's there's a little bit of both mixed into both. You mean the moments and the... Uh... And the portraits. Yeah, so I have them divided here. We've been looking exclusively at the portraits. By the way, thank you, Memory Vessel, for your awesome moderator skills. Oh, um, I, I, I have divided them. And so... Why don't we jump in since it's already looking like what is that eight forty eight? Yeah, the clock? we wow. have a couple more. Let's minutes. look at some of the moments for yeah, a second let's look at the because moments. there's definitely a division. Can we look at pigeon lady? Oh, can we look at? Oh, there's so many good ones. Okay, just pick one. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna, I was gonna invite you to pick one. Um, let's look at pigeon lady. Go up. But that's not one of the moments. That's not a moment. Uh, it's is it up here? Oh, there it is. Is that a moment? I think that's a moment. I think that's one of the ones that he deciphers as moments. And I don't know if it's because it's so fleeting, but all of his images have that fleeting sense to them. Is this one one? This one's not a moment. I think this, I think this one portrait. is in his portraits. Um, I think so. When we start getting into the moments, we start hitting spots like this. Okay. And I think what divides the moment from the portrait is that there's still a figurative subject mm -hmm. in the moment shot, mm -hmm. but his presence in the cityscape um, becomes a little bit more vast. It becomes a little bit more set mm -hmm. in the scene, mm -hmm. right? And so the context has been made a little bit more um, explorable, I guess, mm -hmm. for lack of a better word. Mm -hmm. um, but I love this. And look at the way that top hat on the Abe Lincoln figure 
just sort of weirdly um, sort of accentuates the one point perspective of the street, but in reverse, mm -hmm. right? It's almost like, I, I can't quite put my finger on it, but I love the way the two sort of come together all at a focal point of his face, right smack in the middle of that photo. Mm -hmm. You couldn't get any more like, um, like compositionally perfect than this, all things pointing at this man's head. And this happened in a moment when traffic is going and he's mm -hmm. walking and mm -hmm. all things to the point. Yes. It's beautiful. Let's look at another, how about the one below that? Like this one is also in his moments. I love this. I, I love this too. I, I, figured I you... love the use of typography. Well, it's, it's in a, addition to the the uh, figure. Yeah, there's a perfect opportunity here. Of course. Right. I mean, we're talking about vulnerability. She can't help. She can't not be titled by that box, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, she could be anything but fragile. But somehow, his capturing of her glance, mm -hmm. coupled with that word, created that situation, right? Yeah, it's really beautiful. And her glance is a, a little bit different than some of the others. So usually when they glance at you, they're they're caught in a moment, but hers is like, it's a softer kind of glance. It's not as, right, right. as alarmed or anything as some of the other ones. Oh my be. gosh, Melinda Wax is here. Hi, Todd, Melinda Wax here. I brought Denny to Parsons to teach in continuing ed. Hope you are well, I moved to LA. Ooh. Melinda, it's so good to see you. I'm so glad you're here. It's, I love, I love running into people here. Yes. Right. Yeah, oh my that's gosh, cool. that's great. So, so you know him. He does teach at Parsons. He did teach at Parsons. Yes. At so you were the reason he came to Parsons. That's fantastic. Yeah, I'm trying to see when he taught. He taught. Um, actually, no, it's till present. So he started in September 2015, and he's currently working at Parsons. Um, he's oh, a he's visiting, currently? He's a visiting professor. He teaches photography My and bad. graphic design portfolio. My bad. See. I missed that. Um, and and here, we have, here we have Melinda who brought him over to, to that place. It's beautiful. Thanks for chiming in on that. That's awesome. It's good to see you. Uh, let's see. Memory Vessel says, love the idea of moments. I have, small, I have a small moment series. 63 says, sounds like a take on Andre Brisson's decisive moment, mm -hmm. which I can't quote off the top of my head. It's been a while since I've read that. Uh, memory vessel, isolated archive captures, not read, that's, a, that's an image. I believe that's an image. 63, clarify for me. I'm having a moment where my, my decisive moment wasn't good. Um, let's see, let's see, who else? Melinda Wax say, hi, 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 Todd, good to see you. Um, can you say double entendre? Mm. Yeah, I, mm -hmm. I, I love that in this. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think they are staged. When you hyper focus, you see more. He's collecting moments. Yeah, for sure. Uh, John Park says, I wrote a comment, but it didn't show up evidently. Write it back. Write it back. Yeah. Uh, no, it's a book. Yeah, I thought it was, but it's a concept of picture taking. Yes, I, I, I thought I was right on that, but uh, let's keep going. Oh, this is, this is just gorgeous. This is gorgeous. This is exquisite. Um, it's now this one is a portrait, I believe. Mm, that's a moment. Why is this a moment? Is it? <laughs> See, this is I'm I'm I, f I flounder and I like that. I love um, being challenged because it seems like a portrait. It's you know the adolescent looking at her mom. Sharp contrast. I'm looking at the mom's face there. It's discerning. How is this a moment? I would argue that the a moment with your teenage daughter. I would argue that the 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 contextualization is what makes it the moment, mm. right? In this one, she's turned. She's speaking to the woman next to her, whether mom his or not. His contextualization, saying this is a moment. Is that how you mean his defining? If you it? want to look at it from the Duchamp standpoint, sure. If he says this is a moment, it's a moment. But. I also feel like the fact that she's in action, engaging with her environment in a way. I believe that some of the portraits were a little bit less engaged in the environment. They were in the environment, mm -hmm. but it was a different kind of level of engagement. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm just shooting from the hip here, but that's mm -hmm. what it felt like to me. Mm -hmm. So for example, if we pop into this one, mm -hmm. it's like, well, why isn't this in the portraits? Why is this in the moments? Mm -hmm. And I feel like there is something that, you know, that sets her outside of, 
an image of her. There's an there's a contextualization here. Yes. Right. We're really thinking about what's going through her mind yes. rather than her as a character on the street uh-huh. or her as a momentary sort of, you know, um, individual. Right. right. This is more about what she's feeling. Um, Melinda says, Danny is a genius who has the ability to catch the moment before people realize he's taking a picture of them. Yeah, and that's that's like the meat of a lot of, you know, what we've been talking about. There's a purity to what he's doing, I feel like. There was a purity in those those images I was talking about in terms of chiaroscuro and tenebrism. There's like a, a purity in the darkness. There's like this purity of, 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 of that connected moment. And it's, you know, I wanted to get back to that notion of the selfie, mm. right? And how living in the age of the selfie and a kind of disconnect, a selfie, yeah. even though we see these kids making, so, and we make them too, but these selfies and hyper-idealizing ourselves, it, it ultimately is about a kind of strange human disconnect. Mm-hmm. I want to be seen through the, uh, the filter. Filters. It's very David Foster Wallace, Infinite Jest, mm-hmm. right? So if you haven't read that, I'll just give you a quick snapshot of the one snippet of that I want to pull out of there. But um, he wrote this in the 90s, and he was very ahead of his time. He knew of the fact that AT&T had once developed a phone I think it was in the late 80s, there was a phone that actually had a little video monitor on it and it failed miserably. It was the first attempt at being able to see the person you're talking to. Nowadays, it's commonplace, but it failed. David Foster Wallace sees this as something in the immediate future, but writes about it from this standpoint. He says, it basically starts out where you can see the person you're talking to and then a whole bunch of products are developed to make you look better while you're talking to the other person. So first, it's just really about like, you know, uh, uh, almost like an avatar, almost like a, a skin that you wear that makes you look a little bit better. Then there was a backdrop that made you look like you had a more idealized house. And the funny thing is, is it's talking about what we're living in now, but he wrote it way before it ever happened. So he saw it coming. And that's kind of what's happening now with the notion of a selfie and why I love Featherstone's work is because it runs exactly counter to that. Mm-hmm. It's 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 it, there's a purity, yeah, and and rawness and a rawness mm-hmm. that is way more beautiful than that hyper idealized selfie is mm-hmm. ever going to be, mm. right? I would much rather you know kind of swim around in this content a little bit uh-huh. and think about these people. There he is. There he is. You can see him in this one. Yeah. There's some, oh wait, there's a lot of comments. So John Park rewrote his, maybe there's something wrong, but I, oh, but I can't write more than a few words and have it it post. It was long. You might have some spam rules turned on or something on Twitch. John, thanks. I will, I will check into that. It shouldn't be like that, but you never know. I'm, I could have possibly hit something somewhere. So my apologies on that. Can you break it into a couple of, um, digestible pieces, little, little small pieces. Um, Ben is talking about rich colors in the photo. Yeah, but he can turn that on and off, Mm -hmm. which I love, right? So, you know, like, you know, if we just go back to this for a second, you know, that overall green cast mixed with her red hair, Mm -hmm. right? And that orange, just that splash of orange on the seat behind her. Yeah, high contrast, yes. It's beautiful, right? Again, the saturation of that top of hers, Mm -hmm. you know, with that gray background just sort of gives her center stage Mm -hmm. right but then we go here and it's sort of like everything muddies into that reflective gold silver brass gray tone Mm -hmm. and then we see those two hiding in there right she's picking something out of her eye it's very 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 suzanne vega tom's diner Yes. <laughs> You're like, I don't even know what that means. Well, and I don't know what that means. I don't even I know don't what that means. I don't see that. Well, remember I she... Know, I know it's a... In, in one of her verses, she talks about there's a woman who's looking at her reflection as she's sitting there and they don't see oh, each other. Oh, I guess other. so. But, okay. um, 63 says, no one has read Infinite Jazz. <laughs> he says, I mean, all of it, that is. Read his essays. They're easier to get through. Yeah. No, totally. Um, I will admit, I did read it all. But it took me like six years to read the whole thing. So I don't think I've had any kind of continuous thing. Um, let's see, Ben, I love the lighting on that red head. On the red head, yes, absolutely. And he's in it, a true freelancer. Yes, same here. Yeah, I think we're all in that boat. Mm-hmm. Um, you're still going through the pictures. Yeah, Good. I'm still going through So once we get down there, we're moving into some of the other reference. Oh, no, that's, that's him. 
Mm-hmm. That's Featherstone. Yeah. And that's beautiful. Like, he really caught him in a moment of reflection. It makes the viewer reflect, and it's just, it's so stunning. I really love this one. I love that one, too. I love that <laughs> she just blocks his face out. Well, you know, and that's, I I see a lot of humor in <laughs> this one's This one's, photography. yes. Um, and not necessarily for him or the interaction or for the people participating. The humor is surely on us and in post-production. Like, that's who gets to enjoy those moments. That's right. I mean, there was a choice made here on the part of yeah. Featherstone. Uh-huh. And, and we and I, now I think I see what you were saying before. Right. When you were talking well, about the humor the, side the of it. Well, the lady in gold, for example, like... I'm sure that that was not funny at all when he was standing there and shooting her in the way that she was. But he saw something in her, and in his depiction, we look at it now, and with the the behavior and this this gold repetition and the boss and all that, it's funny. It's really funny, and you see that with this one, too. The The next image is also one of my favorites. I just, I love this. I love the profile. I love that glamour that this um, older woman is partaking in, this beautiful shawl that she's wearing, which has a little bit of crafty chic, but it's probably haute couture, and she's wearing all this great costume jewelry. She's a fantastic mouth. And her profile, her yeah, profile her mouth is, is just, like, just gorgeous. Look at the line that runs from her nose all the way down and around to her chin. It's just mm-hmm. like frames her mouth so beautifully. She's like, do I have anything in my teeth? But mm-hmm. at the same time, this also brings up that, that, that humor element yeah. of it yeah and this is the great thing about featherstone's work is there's a range mm-hmm. the, the woman who's sort of looking at the ground and she's having this moment of pure sadness the the unsuredness of the people that glance up and see the camera these moments where he picks out something like you know this woman checking her teeth in a moment where she doesn't think anyone is looking mm-hmm. or this guy who's clearly like got all the authority in the world in every situation clearly wearing that jacket which 63 wants by the way but his face is just completely <laughs> completely obscured by his wife who's just like aren't we supposed to go this way there's like <laughs> there's, there's something really beautiful there about those really moments is. and and I love the way he picks them out yes he just he does such a he's got such a fantastic guy memory vessel says I love the shawl mom says it's a pom-pom shawl from the 60s mm-hmm. now if anybody's got the authoritative word on that It'll be my mom, and I don't doubt her for a second. It is a beautiful shawl. I would love a pom-pom shawl, All right. so you all know. So if you'd like to support our show, yes. go get a pom-pom shawl, put it in a yes. padded envelope, and send it to. Send it to <laughs> so those are just some supplemental yeah, images of Bill that. Cunningham's work if we needed it. There are a few others we didn't show, but we are winding down. We are winding down. we got to find a few that maybe we didn't see. I oh, love this, one. this dude. And I believe this was in the moments. And I understood why this one might have been. And some of it was the movement of the cape and capturing that. I've noticed his compositions are, he does follow the rule of thirds. Mm -hmm. He does keep those figures lower in that bottom third. Mm -hmm. Um, And he allows the environment to monopolize the top there. But the flow of this robe and this gentleman moving about, and there is some reference to uh, master paintings. Like I think of El Greco when I see this, Mm. or something at the Barnes when they were trying to, when uh, Professor Barnes was trying to copy the pewter vase with the flow of a Greco gown. And this just brought that right to mind. So I can see how he's- Yeah, those draperies. Right, the draperies. It kind of automatically gives it a grandeur. It does, it does, and I could see how this one was a moment. Huh. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. yeah the um, I think I, I, there was one other thing I thought of that I had thought of while we were looking at this stuff. And I, I remember thinking of a Diane Arbus photo. Mm. And I put it in here just so I could reference it. So this is a Diane Arbus photo. And it's obviously a much different kind of photo. But it has that sense of character. You know, you're looking right into the eyes of this person. But Here's the difference, and Diane Armas is a great photographer, and I'm not, you know, I, I'm just really looking to sort of flesh out some differences mm-hmm. in people we might consider to be similar, right? Right. And in this Arbus photo, while I love this guy and his curlers, 
Um, he, this image looks as if it is a frozen video, mm -hmm. as if there's a conversation taking place that we just decided to hit the pause button on. Mm -hmm. And when we unpause this, mm -hmm. the conversation will continue. Mm -hmm. So it's as a photograph is, it's a frozen moment in time. However, <clears throat> I have an anticipation of what happens after this moment, or maybe a, a thought about what this is about. But the difference between that and say this is, and, and you could confuse it very easily, right? I feel like you could confuse that and this very easily. Mm. But there is something here that has this instantaneous kind of genuine connection, mm. right? And I can't quite put my finger on why. Because I think we're in the first second or two of interaction. Well, no, that's that's somebody. definitely, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's definitely it. But that second or two, there is something in the eye. There is something in the recognition. There is something in the connection between the eye and the camera. That guy is looking straight down the barrel of the camera. Do you think, this might be a good piece to to land on, but do you think he's trying to make a decision of what he's going to do? I think there's when so many things. Yeah, there's so many things happening in that like, split moment. Right. How are you going to interact with the photographer who's shooting you? Right. But there's an, there's an opening there inside mm -hmm. to this guy that's not caught in a typical photograph that's posed. It's mm -hmm. just not there. Mm. 63 says, well, I think Arbus was more of a straight uh, yeah, stage, stage portrait. portrait. No, sure. Uh, for sure. Uh, but I just thought that Arbus was a, a very good contrast to this. And, 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 and seeing the difference between the, the guy in the curlers and this guy is, is just a great way to illustrate that, I think. Um, Memory Vessel says Christmas shawl holiday wish list. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so I'm excited. That I'm excited. I, I too. love talking about Featherstone. I work. love him. I absolutely love him. You can follow him on Instagram too. Oh, we've got um, that. Do you have the little? I've got his Instagram. Lower third, so there it's you go. Daniel Featherstone photo on Instagram. Beautiful. And Beautiful you are work. also able to go and check out his website, which is DanielFeatherstone.com, if you want to go check out more of his work. And let me know what you think about the moments versus the portraits. I'm I'm curious what everybody else. Well, I think too. I think that's a good conversation to yeah. have. Um, thanks, Pumpkin Audrey. Thank thanks, you. 63. It's good to have all of you. Um, so keep in mind, next week. Next week. Get over to if you're here on Facebook, leave us a follow. Yes. If you're here on YouTube, give us a subscription. Yes. And if you're on either of those, jump over to Twitch. It's Twitch TV. Twitch.tv forward slash Todd Lambrix in that case. I made that account a long time ago. I'm sorry I didn't include you in the that's name. Okay. But go over to the Twitch side of things and sign up for an account because I think that's where we're going to wind up giving away that Susan Stillman yes. painting, okay? And you definitely want to be there. You're a beautiful, beautiful piece of artwork. You have to come over. Memory Vessel's mentioning Weagle, who's a photographer, and I totally missed that comment in there, so I'm sorry about that. Thank you, Mom. Thank you, Ben. Uh, thank you, Melinda Wax. So good to see you. Hope you'll show up for some more. Melinda, next week we've got Alan Wexler, someone I know you're familiar with. Uh, and we've got some awesome, and we're live with him on the show. Mm -hmm. So keep in mind, the next four shows, live with the artists themselves in their studios. We're excited about that. So excited. So we love you guys. Thanks so much for watching. We will see you next week. And uh, cheers. Cheers. Take care, folks.